Thank you, sisters. That was amazing, amazing. Thank you for that beautiful music and for the spirit which invites her to be with us. At this time, we'll turn the time over to Sister Colleen Earnshaw, who is a missionary serving in the Sunset Beach branch here in our stake. And uh, she will take, she's actually in Elizabeth's home ward, and she will introduce Elizabeth to us tonight. After 
um, Sister Earnshaw's introduction. We'll turn the, the time, obviously, over to Sister Smart um, to instruct us tonight. We look forward to hearing from her. Following Sister Smart, we will sing a closing hymn. On, it's hymn number 223, Have I Done Any Good? After which, Audrey MacArthur will offer our benediction. Thank you, brothers and sisters. In the early hours of June 5, 2002, Elizabeth Smart was abducted at Knife Point from her bedroom in Salt Lake City, Utah. She was only 14 years old. A massive search for Elizabeth began, but to no avail. Over the next several months, much effort was made by Elizabeth's family to keep her presence in the local and national media so that she would not be forgotten. Finally, on March 12, 2003, just over nine months after the abduction, Brian Mitchell, the man who had taken her from her bedroom, was spotted by an alert biker in Sandy, Utah. He, Mitchell was with two other people, one of which was Elizabeth. The biker had watched America's Most Wanted the night before and alerted the police. She was quickly reunited with her family. Most of us remember that moment when she was found, as many of us were heartbroken and had prayed for her safe return. Elizabeth credits her family and friends and her faith for her recovery from this horrific ordeal. She has chosen to be proactive rather than be the victim for the rest of her life. Quote, I only have one life to live, and I'm not going to miss out on it, she said. When I'm through, I want to be able to say, wow, I lived a great life, unquote. She attended BYU Provo, studying in harp performance, and then served a mission in Paris, France. While serving her mission, she met a worthy young elder from Scotland named Matthew Gilmore, whom Elizabeth married in 2012, right here in the La Ie Temple. They have one little daughter, Chloe, who is so cute. Since 2006, Elizabeth has been an active advocate to stop crime against children. She has been to Congress to support the Amber Alert system. In 2011, she founded the Elizabeth Smart Foundation to prevent and stop predatory crimes. Predatory crime, excuse me. Its mission is bring home, bring hope and stop victimization with the goal to empower children through education and understanding of choices and options. In 2013, Elizabeth released a memoir entitled My Story, highlighting the horrific ordeals that she has encountered while she was kidnapped. She wrote the book as a form of closure she said, I want people to know that I am happy in my life right now. I also know Elizabeth on a personal level. She is one of the bravest, strongest women I have ever known. Elizabeth is quiet and does not draw attention to herself, but she also has a great sense of humor. It is her tremendous faith in Jesus Christ that has brought her through the cruelest of circumstances, and she has become a spokesperson for predatory awareness. She speaks with power and is not afraid to stand up to say what is right. She is a great example of overcoming the worst and proving that one can not only survive, but one can thrive after a terrible event. She is a noble daughter of our Heavenly Father, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Elizabeth Smart Gilmore. <clears throat> well, that was just about the nicest introduction I think I've ever received, so thank you. I am so happy to be here with you tonight. I feel that one of God's greatest blessings and gifts to us is the ability to choose, 
to make choices for ourselves, whether they, they be good or whether they be evil. And as I've had the opportunity to travel throughout the United States and meet with so many people and work with so many different organizations, I've found over and over, time and time again, that it's not what happens to us that sets us apart. It's the decisions that we make, it's the choices that we make, the way we decide to, to lead our lives, that is what defines who we truly are. So, so many times, well, first of all, we all have a story. I mean, every single one of us has faced trials or hardship or suffering in our lives. Unfortunately, none of us is immune to that, and I certainly haven't found a way how to avoid that 100% yet. Still working on it, I haven't found it. But it's what we decide to do after that really defines who we are. I, as a 14-year-old girl, was very shy, was very quiet. But the one thing that I did know was that I had a Heavenly Father who loved me from as far back as I can remember. My parents always try to teach me about the try to teach me the gospel try to teach me to have faith in heavenly father and in jesus christ and the atonement the first time that i really remember really feeling my heavenly father's love for me when was when i was about 7 years old one of the things that i love to do more than anything is to ride horses and my grandpa he he was a true cowboy for me. He was my hero growing up. He was the person that I wanted to be like. And every summer we would go up to my grandparents' ranch and I would wake up at the crack of dawn and go wake up my grandpa and we would go and ride horses all day. And at the end of a ride, I would say, come on, grandpa, can we go again? Can we go again? I think he probably grew to dread the end of the ride because he knew another ride was coming. But <laughs> he always took me out for another ride. I mean, that's a sign of a grandpa who really loves you. Anyways, one summer, I was about seven years old. We had gone up to my grandparents' ranch. I had woken him up at the crack of dawn. I couldn't wait to go out on a horseback ride. My grandparents had recently purchased a new horse, and I wanted to ride this horse more than anything. So we got down to where the pasture was located, and my grandpa said to me, Elizabeth, you can ride any horse you can catch and saddle and bridle. So I said, okay. So I went out, I caught this horse that I had never ridden before, I didn't know anything out, but I was so excited. I came back, I, sa I well, he helped me saddle and bridle it, but I just couldn't wait to go. In the meantime, I had some other siblings and cousins show up who decided they wanted to go for the ride as well. Anyways, my grandpa asked me, what, what trail would you like to go on? Where would you like to go? And there was this one trail that in my mind was the biggest, baddest trail out there, and that was the trail I wanted to go on, and we called it the Salt Trail. And the Salt Trail, <clears throat> it goes up the side of a mountain and is quite steep, but you come to a point where you can look out across the valley that my grandparents' ranch is situated in, and it is so beautiful. You can see a river winding its way through the valley. It's just beautiful. But it's quite a hike to get up there. I mean, it's not easy. And so when we got all the way up there, my grandpa said, okay, well, we need to give the horses a rest, so we're just going to stop for a minute. Now, in my seven-year-old mind, I thought a rest meant, you know, get off the horse, let the horse lie down, take a nap. That was a rest to me. Uh, horses, they don't need that. <laughs> Only seven-year-old girls need that. <laughs> Anyways, I got off my horse and let go of the guide rope, let go of the reins, and I had walked probably, I don't know, five feet away from my horse, and that horse had no loyalty to me, no loyalty to the other horses it was with. I mean, they still picked on him. He was brand new. And that horse turned around and shot down the mountain as fast as he could go. My grandpa went running after him for a short ways, calling for him to come back, but he had no loyalty. He wasn't going to come back. So my grandpa turned around, 
huffed and puffed his way back up the mountain to where we were standing. He said, well, Elizabeth, you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to get that horse because we're going to finish the ride and you have to go get it. You lost it. So I said, okay. And I turned around and I started walking down the mountain. The trail, it was early summer and in the mountains, early summer is like late spring. So the grasses and the brush was, it hadn't been trampled down yet. The trail wasn't well defined. It, they were overgrown and I, w I mean, I was seven. I was pretty little at the time and I wandered off the path. I, could, I couldn't see it anymore, and I got lost, and I remember being so scared. I had such a vivid imagination as a seven-year-old. All I could think of were there were lions and tigers and bears hiding behind every tree. Oh, my. And <clears throat> I, I just didn't know what to do. I remember just being so scared, thinking, oh, I'm never going to see my family again. What am I going to do? And I remember I had been in primary the Sunday before, and... The lesson had been on prayer and how we could always turn to the Lord in prayer and he would hear us. He will always answer us. And we'd sung in, in singing time a child's prayer. And that always made me feel a little bit better because any time I ever had a really a doubt in my mind if he was there, it was in a song. The, I mean, there was a question in a song. You know, Heavenly Father, are you really there? And he is. And that always made me feel a little bit better. So anyways, remembering this song, remembering the lesson that I had on, had on prayer in primary, I decided that I'd try it because I didn't have anything else to lose. And just maybe, maybe my prayer would be heard and I'd be rescued or I'd find the trail and I'd be able to make it back home. And so I remember kneeling down and I remember praying. And I mean, my seven-year-old prayer, it just kind of went, Heavenly Father, please save me. Please don't let me get eaten. Please help me find the trail again. And so on. Anyways, I finished my prayer, and I remember just feeling this calm feeling that it was going to be okay, and that nothing was going to happen to me, and I just, I just needed to be oh, I just needed to be, I just needed to calm down and be okay with the situation. Anyways, I calmed down enough and I remember having this prompting that I should walk in a certain direction. Now logically, if I had thought logically at all at seven years old, all I would have had to do was walk down the mountain and I would have eventually ran into the road, but I didn't think that way. Uh, so I remember just following this prompting and I came across the trail. It actually only happened to be like six feet away from me. <laughs> but I started walking down this trail, and not only had Heavenly Father heard my prayer and protected me and guided me back to the trail, but he sent someone out to find me, a fellow horseback rider from another cabin not too far away came up on the trail, and she took one look at me and she said, well, I know you're a smart because of that blonde hair. Do you need a ride back to your cabin? And I remember saying, yes, I do. And I was then delivered basically, well, not quite door to door, but mountain to door, um, back to the cabin. And I remember just knowing from that moment forward that I really did have a heavenly father who really did love me and knew, knew where I was. and would comfort me and would always be there for me. Well, that was, as I said, one of the, mo the first experiences I really can remember where my testimony started to stand on its own. When I was 14, the testimony that I'd been growing from my tiny little seed <coughs> was really shaken. I remember it was right before I was about to graduate from junior high and Holy cow, I don't know if you guys, how you felt about junior high or for those of you who are going through it right now, but you could basically sum up my junior high experience in one word, and that would be awkward. Wow. 
it was, it was so bad. Most of my friends would talk about you know, who their crush was, who they were going to hang out that weekend with. I was still trying to figure out just how to talk to a boy. Anyways, somehow in my mind, I thought once I got to high school, all of that awkwardness would melt away and life would be okay. I just felt like once I made it to high school, I would have really arrived. I mean, that was the pinnacle of life. How little I knew. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> it was, I was going to graduate from junior high the next day, and I was just so excited. I remember going to bed that night the same way that I did every night. I shared a room with my younger sister growing up, always. And I even shared a bed with her, and I remember crawling into bed next to her and falling asleep. And then the next thing I remember was hearing a voice. And it was a strange voice. I didn't, I didn't recognize it. And at first I thought it had to be part of my dream or my imagination. It couldn't really be real because I was at home. I was in my bed. I was in the place that I thought was most safe in the entire world. And then I heard this voice again, repeating, saying the same thing over again, saying, I have a knife at your neck. Don't make a sound, get up and come with me. And when I heard the voice that second time, I realized that it, it wasn't my imagination, it wasn't a dream. There really was a stranger in my bedroom holding a knife against my neck, I could feel it, and someone's arm, hand was on my arm trying to pull me out of bed. I had never been so scared in my entire life. And up until that moment, I always felt like I'd been pretty prepared for anything that I might come across. I mean, I had been taught, oh, you know, if, you get, if you catch on fire, you should stop, drop, and roll. And if you're in a, an earthquake, you should get under your desk or stand in a door frame and, and don't cross the street unless you look both ways. I mean, I'd been taught like all of the basic safety rules that you're supposed to learn as a kid, but no one had ever told me what I should do if someone broke into my house in the middle of the night and kidnapped me at knife point. I mean, nothing had ever prepared me for anything like that before. I remember just being so scared that it was like I was paralyzed and I just... I didn't feel like I had a choice. I felt like I had to do exactly as I was told because I didn't know if he had gone through my house already, if he had killed my parents or my brothers. And I didn't know that if, I mean, what if I fought back and, and he killed me or he hurt my sister? The one thing I did know though was that she was still alive and she was asleep next to me in bed. And so I did as he told me, and he led me out through my house, and he led me up into the mountains behind my house. And I remember on the way up, just praying and praying and praying so hard, just thinking of all of the stories that, that we are taught about in the scriptures. I thought of Moses parting the Red Sea, Noah and the ark, Nephi and the brass plates, the Leahona, I mean, I just thought of all of these different scripture stories and miracle after miracle and thinking, surely if Heavenly Father has provided all of these miracles, he can provide one for me. Surely he can help me escape. I remember stopping my captor and asking him if he realized what he was doing and that if he got caught, he'd spend the rest of his life in prison and begging him and promising him that if he let me go, that my family wouldn't press any charges, that it would be like this never happened. And I remember he stopped and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, I know exactly what the consequences are. The only difference is I'm not going to get caught. And I remember he had me keep on running and keep on going farther and farther up into the mountains. And I remember just praying so hard and being so scared that maybe Heavenly Father had already provided a way for me to escape and I'd missed it. And worrying that maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe I, I had missed something or I'd done something wrong somewhere along the line. And I just remember praying and praying and praying and, and begging Heavenly Father to protect me and to help me make it back home. Well, I was finally brought right over the top of the mountain, and we were about a quarter of the way down the other side when we came to a grove of trees, not all that strange, considering 
Many of the mountains in Utah's are covered in trees. <laughs> but I remember being directed to go inside of this grove of trees. And once I had, I saw how part of the mountainside had been leveled out. And there was a tent set up. And outside the tent, there were tarps on the ground and tarps hanging up in the trees. And there was a piece of skinny metal cable running through the camp. And there was this big hole dug out behind the tent that had these big logs laid across the top. And then all of the dirt that had been dug out had then been thrown back up on top of the logs. And <coughs> then I remember seeing a woman emerge from the tent. And she was unlike any woman I'd ever seen before. I mean... Yes, she was dressed differently, but that's not what set her apart. It was just this dark feeling that just... I just knew that she, she wasn't good. She wasn't someone I wanted to be around. And the first thing she did was hug me, and it, it wasn't a nice hug. I mean, if anything, it was like she was trying to tell me that I should never cross her because I'd be sorry if I did. And I remember she brought me inside of the tent and sat me down on this upturned bucket. And I remember just being so scared and so worried and just wondering how had this happened to me? I mean, why had this happened to me? I I was I was nobody. Like there was no reason for this to happen to me. And what, what was going on at home? Was my family okay? Were my parents okay? Did they even know I was gone yet? Were they looking for me yet? I remember being so scared and so worried. And in the meantime, this woman, she'd brought in this small little basin and filled it up with water and had started to try to give me a sponge bath. Well, as I mentioned, I was so shy <laughs> as a 14-year-old. And kind of to help you get to know me, I just want to share a funny little incident that I think does a pretty good job of summing me up at that age. So I come from a very large family. Uh, my mom was eight of nine kids. I have over 50 cousins just on the one side. Um, I think there's something like 200 of the next generation now. Um, anyways, they're not even involved in this story. But so I fall on the young side of the cousins. And because I grew up playing the harp, uh, I got volunteered all the time to play the background music at all of my cousin's weddings. Anyways, <clears throat> one of my cousins, you know, it was her wedding. I got volunteered to play. I was playing. Unfortunately, my attention span was uh, rapidly diminishing. And so I decided I'd take a break, I'd go use the ladies' room, stop by the dessert table, and then go back to finish playing. So I got up, went to the restroom, walked, you know, came back out, headed toward the dessert table, and I noticed some people laughing. I didn't really think very much of it. I kept on walking, and I noticed some more people laughing. And pretty soon, my mom came running up to me. She said, Elizabeth, darling, you've got a little problem you have tucked the back of your dress into your underwear. You might just want to, you know, fix that little wardrobe malfunction. Well, I was mortified. I spent the rest of the evening hiding in one of the bathroom stalls until my mom came and got me. And I remember her telling me that at least half of the people there were women. And there's not a single woman that doesn't understand what it's like trying to deal with you know, your underclothing and your nylons and your slip and your dress, trying to maneuver all of that. It's a lot. Men, you have no idea what we go through. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, she said, it's okay. And you know what? Mostly everyone here is related to you. They're basically obligated to love you. It's okay. Well, that just didn't make me feel any better. I mean, if anything, it just it made me feel worse because I'd have to live the rest of my life with everyone knowing what my underwear I looked like at, you know, 14 years old. <laughs> oh, I was so embarrassed. Anyways, that was me at 14. I mean, just even around people that loved me, I was still embarrassed. So hopefully 
that can kind of give you an idea of how I would feel having a complete stranger try to undress me, sponge bathe me. That was just beyond anything that I would ever be comfortable with. I remember grabbing hold of the buttons on my pajamas and I remember clamping my elbows down next to my torso and just begging and begging and pleading with her to let me do it myself. I wasn't dirty, I showered last night, I was a big girl, I could, I could change myself if she really wanted me to change. Then she could give what she wanted me to wear and I'd put it on myself. Well, she finally gave in, which I didn't realize what a big deal that was at that point in time and then she uh, told me once I had this robe on to take off my clothes underneath and then I did so she scooped up all of my stuff and got up and left me alone in the tent and I remember just sitting on this upturned bucket being so scared and so shaken I mean I never ever imagined anything like this could have ever have happened to me I mean I I came from a good family. I came from what I thought was a safe neighborhood. I mean, I was 14 years old. Like, how crazy could a 14-year-old's life get who's from Salt Lake City, Utah? I don't know. Anyways, <clears throat> I remember the tent door unzipping, and then in came this man, and he knelt down next to me, and he started to speak to me. And I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying initially, but I was too worried about why this had happened to me and what was gonna happen next and how was my family gonna know that I was still alive? How was I gonna make it back to my family? All of these other different thoughts. But then I had this thought that I should probably listen to what he was saying so that I could find a way to communicate with my family, to let them know that I was okay, let them know that I was safe or, or find a way to get back to them. So I calmed down enough to hear the last sentence that he said, which probably was the worst sentence because he said, I hereby seal you to me as my wife before God and his angels as my witnesses. Ugh. I mean... That was just so far beyond anything I could have ever expected and anything that I would ever have been okay with. I mean, I grew up every single day singing, I love to see the temple, and my, having my mom tell me that you know, the one thing that I, want, that I needed to strive for in life was to get married in the temple, but not to just anyone, to my Prince Charming, basically. And... I mean, that was the one thing I really remember growing up that I always knew that I wanted was to get married in the temple. And all of a sudden, here I am, 14 years old, being told that I was this old goat's wife. Anyways, I remember just screaming out, no. And he looked at me and he said, if you ever scream out like that again, I will kill you. And then I remember trying to to tell him all of the reasons why this wasn't okay, all of the reasons why this would never be okay and why it wouldn't work. And I'm sure every reason that you can think of was one that I said. And unfortunately, every time I came up with a reason, he had uh, his comment back to me was the same over and over and over again, which was, we now need to consummate our marriage. And as a 14-year-old, I had lived in, well, basically what you would call a bubble up until that point in my life. I mean, my parents, they were very, very protective of us, um, very strict with us. And so, yes, you could say that I, I didn't, uh, I was naive to many different parts of life. Anyways, I remember having this thought of what he could possibly mean in my head, and I remember thinking, no, there's no way that one human being could do that to another. There's just, it's not possible. No one is that evil. And unfortunately, there are people that evil. I remember him physically forcing me on the ground and, and raping me, and when he was finished, he got up, smiled, turned around, and walked out of the tent like it wasn't a big deal. But I'll never forget 
how I felt, how life-shattering that felt to me. I remember just feeling like I could no longer be loved. I was no longer worthy to be a human being, period. I remember just feeling like nobody could ever... I'd been broken into too many pieces. Nobody could ever fit every piece back together ever again. I mean, there was just... I felt parts of me that would, would be gone forever. And, and I remember thinking of stories of children that I'd seen on the news who had maybe a similar story. They disappeared, they were raped, and then ultimately they were murdered. And I remember thinking in that moment that they were the lucky ones because they would never ever again feel this pain that I now felt, that they would never again feel this shame and this embarrassment. And, and to me, I feel like Heavenly Father knows all of his children and loves all of his children. And, he, and if anyone deserves a ticket straight back to heaven, it's those children who have been hurt and who have been abused and who their lives have been stolen from, from them. And I remember in that moment wishing that I could be one of those children, wishing that I could be in a place where I would no longer feel pain and where I would no longer have these terrible feelings of just worthlessness and, and filth. And I ended up falling asleep to that. And when I woke up, there was this man kneeling over me. And he had taken a thin piece of metal cable and had wrapped it around my ankle and had bolted it into place. And I remember following this cable to see what it was connected to. And it was actually connected to that piece of metal cable that I had seen when I first was brought into the camp. And it was just long enough for me to lie down inside the tent and just long enough for me to use the bucket. <clears throat> And I remember just feeling like <sighs> my life was over, but I was still living. <laughs> feeling like <sighs> I just wanted to give up right then and there. And I remember sitting down and just crying. And I, I couldn't help but think of my family and think of life as I'd known it before and wondering what they were all doing, wondering if they, would, if they would remember me, if they would miss me, if they would continue to search for me in a few days, in a few weeks, months. I mean, what if it was years? What if I was gone so long that I forgot who I was? And that thought really scared me. And so I wanted to, I always wanted to know who I was and, and remember who I was and remember my family. So. I started to think of everyone and everything that was important to me. And among those people, probably the most important person that I wanted to remember was my mother. And I remember <clears throat> trying to just immortalize everything about her in my memory. And as I was sitting there trying to just memorize every little bit, every little memory, everything she used to say to me. One very specific memory came to mind. I had come home from school and I was very upset and she had sat me down and she had asked me what was wrong and so I told her how I'd been sitting at a group, at a table with a group of friends and the most popular girl in the whole school had come over and she said, oh, this weekend I'm having a party, you're all invited. Well, that is, all of you, except you. You're not invited. And I felt crushed and I told my mom that, and she, I think she was relieved. I think she thought that maybe someone had died or something worse by the way I was acting. Anyways, <laughs> she went on and she said, Elizabeth, <clears throat> you know, first of all, it's gonna be that bad spending another weekend at home with me. And, and second of all, these girls that you're sitting with, you know, were." Were they really your friends? Wouldn't a true friend say something like, come on, Elizabeth, you know, we'll have our own party this weekend, or I'll hang out with you, or you know, we'll go paint our nails, or eat ice cream, or popcorn, or something. Isn't that what a true friend would say instead of just abandoning you? And thirdly of all, <clears throat> you know, popular, well, it's just another word for rude. 
sometimes. <laughs> so you will go many places in your lifetime and you'll meet many people and, and opinions will be made and you won't always understand why you know, why some people like you, why some people don't like you. But of all these opinions that matter, there's really only a few that truly count. The first one is Heavenly Father, and he loves you so much. You are his daughter, and <clears throat> he'll always be there for you. He'll always want the very best for you, no matter where you go or what you do. He'll always be there for you. He'll always want to be a part of your life. You'll never, you'll never be so far away from him that you, he can't reach you or that he'll have given up on you. And the second person whose opinion you should, you know, really worry about, well, that's mine. And I'm your mother and I will always love you. I will always care about you. I will always want the very best for you. And nothing can ever change that. We are a family, and we're not just a family, we're an eternal family. That means we'll be a family forever. Even if one of us dies, you'll always be my daughter. And as I sat on this mountainside, remembering this memory, I realized that she was right. I realized that I always had my Heavenly Father to turn to, and my Savior <clears throat> to turn to, that they'd always be there for me, I wasn't alone, and that I would always have my mother, and she would always love me, and she'd always care about me, and she'd always want the best for me, and it didn't matter, any of these things that had happened to me, none of them would make her love me any less. And in that moment, I realized that I had something that these people couldn't take away from me. I had, I had hope. I had faith to hold on to. I had a love that nobody could change, nobody could destroy, no matter how hard they tried. And for me, <clears throat> that helped me to make the most important decision I could have during the entire nine months I was kidnapped. That helped me to decide that I would do whatever it took to survive, and it didn't matter what it was. I would do it if it meant that I would survive. And that decision saw me through so many times, so many times I wanted to give up, so many times that I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't stand it another minute longer, I couldn't go on. <clears throat> I remembered that I had something they couldn't take away from me. It was the hardest nine months of my life and there wasn't a single day that went by that I didn't pray to my Heavenly Father asking to go home, asking to, whether it was home with my family or my heavenly home, I just wanted to get away from my two captors. It was the hardest time of my life, without a doubt. But at the same time, it was one of the most spiritual times of my life because I felt my Savior's presence so strongly in my life. I knew that he was aware of everything that I was going through, of everything that I felt. He, he knew he was there and that I didn't have to be alone and that it would be okay in the end. It would be okay one way or another. It would be okay. Well, nine months passed. And during that time period, my captors had moved me to California. They had started to speak of new places to go. And I remember thinking I had to get back to Utah. Well, miraculously, and it truly was a miracle, I was able to convince my captors that we needed to return to Utah. So we hitchhiked back, which, whoa. <laughs> definitely would not recommend to anyone doing. But we, we did make it back to Salt Lake, and I remember just being so excited and so hopeful that I was back in Utah. I mean, even if I wasn't back at home, 
I was physically that much closer to my family, physically that much closer to, to my home. And I remember my captors saying that, that they were going to take me back up into the mountains and that I wouldn't be allowed to leave the mountains again for probably years. And so I remember walking up State Street in Salt Lake just trying to I don't, soak up every second of it. And I remember all of a sudden a police car pulling up and pretty soon we were surrounded by police officers and I would be lying if I didn't tell you that I was scared. I mean, because for nine months I had watched my captors get away with everything that they did. I mean, they lied, they stole, they had kidnapped me, they'd abused me, no one had ever stopped them, no one had ever stood in their way. They'd been approached by police officers before, this wasn't the first time. And I'd always been told that if I ever did anything they didn't want me to do, that they'd kill me, or that they'd kill my family. And to me, in those moments, I mean, they seemed invincible because nobody had ever stopped them before. Nobody had ever prevented them from doing anything that they wanted to do. So those threats, when they told me that they'd kill me or they'd kill my family, they were very real to me. And so when the police officers first started questioning me, uh, I felt like I not only had to protect myself, but that I needed to protect my family. And more than anything, yes, of course I wanted to be rescued, but I didn't want to be rescued at the price of maybe my family's life. And so initially, I did give them the answers that I had been told to give, and then one of the officers noticed how scared and nervous I was, and so he separated me from my captors just a ways off and started to question me again. And this time he said, there's this girl, and she's been missing now for a very long time. Her family has searched for her for so long, and they, they miss her, and they love her more than anything, and they want her to come home. Don't you want to come home? And it was only in that moment that I finally found the courage to admit who I was, and I remember I was then transported to the police station where I was brought into this little tiny room, didn't have any windows, there was just a little dingy sofa in there, and I was left alone, and in my mind I kept thinking, wait a second, wait a second, uh, if they thought I was innocent, wouldn't they have taken me home, or at least let me call my family? I mean, even if they think I'm guilty of something, don't I still deserve a phone call? Isn't that one of my rights? Oh my gosh, I am going to prison. I'm going to prison. I can't believe it. After nine months of this, I'm going to prison. Okay. Ah, <sighs> prison. Oh my goodness. Well, they've got showers, they've got beds, they've got jumpsuits, they're not couture, but my, my goodness, nothing I've worn for the last nine months has been couture. <laughs> it's been the same thing. It hasn't been washed. That's disgusting. <sighs> you know what? Considering everything, prison actually sounds like a pretty big step up compared to where I've been the last nine months. And I remember in that moment, the door burst open and my dad came running into the room. And I remember he just looked at me for a second and then he came running over and he picked me up in the biggest hug. And it took me a minute to respond because here I was thinking I was going to prison all of a sudden, my dad, like, materializes out of thin air. I could hardly believe it. I mean, it just took a minute for the dots to connect in my little brain. And then they finally did. And in that moment, I knew that Heavenly Father had rescued me. I knew that it was going to be okay. I knew that no matter what lay ahead of me, it was going to be all right. And that my dad... He was never going to let anyone else hurt me again the way that these two people had hurt me the last nine months. I remember being so happy and so grateful and just knowing that it was going to be okay. We were then transported up to headquarters in Salt Lake, downtown Salt Lake, where I was reunited with my mom again. And I remember seeing her and thinking she looked just like an angel. and. I do believe that Heavenly Father does send us angels and that sometimes we see them, sometimes we don't see them, sometimes 
they're people we know, and sometimes they're just random strangers. But for me, my mom has always been my angel. And <laughs> never more so than in that moment. She was the best, the best thing I could have had, seen, been around. <laughs> That was one of the happiest moments of my life, was seeing my mom again. I remember the following morning I was in talking with her because that's what moms and daughters do for you boys that don't know. We talk to our mothers. They're our best friends. So when you get married, you know, cut us some slack. <laughs> Anyways, um, I was about to leave. I was probably, I don't know, going off for my fifth or sixth shower because believe me, nine months of not showering does catch up with you. It does take a while to get rid of the smell. Anyways, <clears throat> I was leaving her room when she stopped me and she said, Elizabeth, what these people have done to you is terrible and there aren't words strong to describe how wicked and evil they are. They have stolen nine months of your life from you that you will never get back. But the best punishment you could ever give them is to be happy, is to move forward with your life, to do all of the things that you want to do because at the end of the day, God is our ultimate judge and, and you don't need to worry about whether or not restitution is made or whether or not they've really been fully punished for what they've done. You don't need to worry about that because in the end, everything will be made right. Everything will be made up to you that you've lost. And you know, for these people that have hurt you, you, you just don't need to worry about them. Heavenly Father will take care of it all. And by feeling sorry for yourself and by holding on to the past and reliving it and dwelling in it, you're only allowing these people to steal more of your life away from you. And they don't deserve that. They don't deserve a single second more. So you need to be happy, and you need to move forward with your life. And I've certainly always tried to follow her advice. I'm sure <laughs> my life would, I would run into less, let's see, how can I say this? I would have less problems if I followed her advice better. <laughs> That's probably the best way I can say it. I mean, I do my best, but I am only human. And I still have my, my bad days. I still have... You know, TSA security still drives me nuts. I ran into my garage door. I backed up into my garage door the other day. I mean, it was closed. How do you not see a closed garage door? I don't know. But I did it. And sometimes, sometimes I have to be reminded. It's usually my husband who... He's Scottish, and yes, that's why I married him, because he has a nice accent, and yes, he got married in a kilt, and yes, he's so cute in it. Um, so yes to all of that, but he usually likes to point out in those moments, oh, right, Elizabeth, you know, you're being a bit of a hypocrite. <sighs> you know, that usually... That just usually doesn't go over that well with me. Usually then tends to focus my anger on him a little bit. But um, he's right. My mom's right. Every single one of us have struggles in our life. Every single one of us has a story. <sighs> we have challenges. We have, we have mountains to climb. Good heavens. I mean, we all have our struggles. But at the end of the day, it's the choices that we make that define who we are. Whether we allow our struggles to overwhelm us and to define us, or whether or not we say, this, is, this happened, it's terrible, it's going to take me some time to get through it, but that's my goal. I'm going to get through it, and I'm going to go on, and I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to have a great life. I mean, that decision is up to every single one of us to make. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we have those decisions. I'm so grateful that Heavenly Father has given us our free agency to choose, has given us that, that control and that power over our lives. I'm so grateful for that. 
And I'm so grateful for my Savior because I couldn't have made it through my kidnapping without him. I couldn't be where I am today without him. If I thought that I was in this by myself, that there was nobody else who knew how I felt, who understood what I went through, I, I couldn't be here. I couldn't be here without the righteous men in my life who have set an example of how to honor their priesthood, of how to live worthy lives. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. I, I would have lost my faith in humanity, most of all in men. But I'm so grateful for the gospel. I'm so grateful for how it teaches us to live our lives, to, for the freedom that it gives us, for the happiness that we can have through it. I'm so grateful for my Savior that I can turn to him no matter what and that I don't have to worry about working through my problems by myself. I'm so happy that I know that I can turn to Jesus Christ and know that he is right there with me and he can, can take my burdens from me, that he can carry them for me. And I'm so grateful for the knowledge that despite everything all of us go through, all of it can be turned to our good. All of it can, can be made right in the end. And not only just be made right, but good can come of it. I would never, ever say, sign me up. I'd love to go through that again. <laughs> I'd never say that. That's just crazy. But I can say that I'm not sorry that it happened to me because of what it's taught me, because of the testimony that it gave me, because of the opportunities that have come because of it, the opportunities to meet so many different people, to work with so many amazing organizations, to come to beautiful Hawaii and be here with you tonight. Because let's be real for a moment. Had I not been kidnapped, I mean, I know I'm charming and witty, but my charm and wit is not so great that I would have got here otherwise. <laughs> I wouldn't have. So I'm grateful for that experience. I'm grateful that Heavenly Father has taught me to see that good does come of bad and that we can all make a difference just by being who we are. And so I just want to say that I know that the gospel is true. I know that we can hold on to it at any point, well, we should hold on to it always, but when we're alone, when we feel like life is caving in all around us, I know that we can hold on to that and that we will be safe by holding on to the gospel. I know that we have a savior that has atoned for, for our sins and not just our sins, but everything that has happened to us, that he knows what we have been through and he won't, leave, he won't abandon us that he won't belittle what's happened to us. <laughs> Someone who has suffered all things and still cares about what happens to each of us. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for the hope that it's given me in my life. I'm so grateful for the love and the joy that it's brought into my life. Um, I would just say to all of you who are struggling at this point, whether, no matter what, what it is, to never lose faith. Miracles do happen. They happen every single day. And that you never need to be alone because we have a Heavenly Father who is constantly watching over us and guiding us and loving us. And he cares about every, every little thing in our life. He cares. And 
With that, I just want to say again, thank you so much for having me. And it's truly been a blessing to be here with you uh, this evening and today and tomorrow. And I, f I feel very blessed right now. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.